part of the life of the church is uh, following in some of the traditions. And some of you say, well, well, I thought we were a church that doesn't follow traditions. We don't follow men's traditions, but we follow biblical traditions. And the biblical tradition we're going to celebrate this morning is scriptural. And so I would uh, like to have Kelsey King come forward with her. <coughs> As we will witness together as a church body, the dedication of a child in church. Jesus was dedicated in the temple. And so, come this morning. Crowd around and snap some shots. Kelsey, stand right here in the front of the church. Before you this morning is the newborn Hazel Nicole King. When we look at the scripture and we look at the biblical references to the name Hazel is of the tree or life giver and Nicole is victory or victory of the people and king is the term specifically of an ordained king. Thus her biblical name is the tree of life giving victory by the king. Children are a gift from the Lord. Psalm 127, 3 proclaims that the sons are a heritage of the Lord. Children are a reward from him. As believers, we are called to recognize that children belong first and foremost to God. God in his goodness gives children as gifts to parents. They not only have the awesome responsibility of caring for this gift, but also the wonderful privilege of enjoying the gift. Because children belong to God and are given by grace as a gift, it is only proper and appropriate that children should be dedicated back to God. We are told in 1 Samuel 1 that Hannah presented her son Samuel to the Lord. And we read that Mary and Joseph brought their baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem in order to present him before the Lord. In the same way, Kelsey today brings her child, Hazel Nicole King, presenting first herself and then her child before the Lord our God. Kelsey, I'll call your attention the commands of God recorded in the Holy Scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. It tells us this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Ephesians 4, 6 says, Parents, do not provoke your children to wrath. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. God's instructions are plain. Kelsey, love God with every ounce and fiber of your energy and teach Hazel to do the same. And as you love God, you will model before Hazel a wonderful love for God that she will one day want for herself. So, Kelsey, by coming forward before God and this people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourself and Hazel to the Lord? If so, respond by saying, I do. I do. Having come freely, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and this people, so that Hazel may walk in the abundant life that Christ offered. Do you, Kelsey, vow by God's help and in partnership with the church to provide Hazel a Christian home of love and peace to raise her in the truth of the Lord's instruction and discipline and to encourage her to one day trust Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. I do. Modeling this kind of love cannot be done alone. It requires the help of others. And for this reason, I ask the church to make the vow as well. Parents have first responsibility, but parents need the help and support of their church family. So I direct my questions now to the congregation. Its leaders, its teachers, and its members, by being present in God's house today, do you hereby declare yourselves to be the children of God because you trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life? If this is true, please respond by saying we do. We do. do. Would you please stand, congregation? <coughs> <coughs> Having come freely, I ask now that you make the following commitment to those who stand before you, young Kelsey and Hazel, so that Hazel and Nicole may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you vow by God's help 
to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ, to help Kelsey to be faithful to God and to help teach and train Hazel Nicole in the ways of the Lord so that she might one day trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If you accept this responsibility, please respond by saying we do. We do. <laughs> the first century church, it was custom that the child be handed to the priest in the temple or the pastor. And the prayer of dedication is that she's, she's either charismatic or she's hungry. That's what I was going to say. Father God, we lift up to you this child. I pray your hand upon her, on the mother. Bless, keep healthy, watch over, guide and direct. We offer her to you and we understand that you bring life into this world. And nobody leaves except by your say. And so, Father, we ordain now this moment that your hand be on her, the child, guide and direct. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said. Amen. All right. Hold on for just a second. We've got something else here for you. Our Patches of Hope team always make a quilt for the newborn baby. It comes with a prayer. And we give every newborn child its first uh, version uh, of the Bible. So she's got a little pink Bible here. A little hazel. That's for the mom. And a certificate. And then this prayer comes with this that the uh, team at Patches of Hope do for the child. So we would like to give that to you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. <coughs> if you have your Bibles, open them to Genesis chapter 2. We get into our series. About balancing life, this week we're going to be talking about the first part of this balance in a sermon entitled, Workaholics Anonymous, Do We Need to Join? <laughs> it's going to be a rough one. The, uh, I was feeling guilty and had to stop and pray in the middle of doing this sermon. And uh, So as we look at the scripture this morning, as we look at balance, we're going to go through this series over the next five weeks about work, about family about our hobbies, about our life, uh, about our Christian walk. And last week we talked a little bit about it, uh, about how it's important that you have to nail down that relationship first, that you have to be praying with your spouse, that you have to have those disciplines as a Christian in your quiet time and your growth and discipleship. If you're not doing those things, you're going to be struggling right away. If you're just coming on Sundays... It's like going to a gas station with your vehicle and filling up with gas. If you're not doing preventative maintenance, if you're not changing the oil, if you're not doing the things necessary to keep it running, it's ultimately going to fail. And so it is important that we the, keep the marriage uh, holy and sanctified by doing the preventive maintenance to it. That's the quiet times and the times spent together and to, and to achieve balance within the family. So there's many parts to that component, and we're going to start off with... This, you know, if you're from the South, you know Jeff Foxworthy, right? He's the guy who, who's, he, he made the word redneck universal, really famous, and, uh, you know, he's always at redneck jokes. He, you might be a redneck if, you know, those little, like, you might be a redneck if your uh, salad bowls have Cool Whip stamped on the side of it, right? <laughs> well, we've got some this morning that might identify if you're a workaholic. <coughs> In case you're wondering whether you might be one or not, uh, consider the following. You might be a workaholic if it frustrates you that you don't allow laptops on the Ferris wheel. You might be a workaholic, <laughs> right? If you are looking forward to Christmas this year because you've decided to take that afternoon off, you might be a workaholic. <laughs> If you don't drink any beverages during the day because you lose time having to go to the bathroom, you might be a workaholic. <laughs> If a pay-per-view movie is your idea of vacation, you might be a workaholic. If you promise your spouse, this is the only Sunday I'm going to work more than 10 times in the last year, you might be a workaholic. If you promise your spouse, this is the only, uh, or excuse me, if you bring your spreadsheets to your son's football game, you might be a workaholic. 
If you use your cell phone in the shower to return business calls, <laughs> you might be a workaholic. If you set your alarm for 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. so that you can simply check your voicemail, you might be a workaholic. <laughs> If you carry family pictures in your wallet so you can remember what they look like, you might be a workaholic. If your idea of an intimate anniversary celebration is taking your spouse to the formal business meeting at your work, you might be a workaholic. Those things, though funny and humorous, describe anything but, I think, and there are some serious telltale signs we got to look at this morning that tend to give us a tendency to lean perhaps too much to be a workaholic and not be in balance with life. When people you love say that you work too much on a consistent basis, you probably might be a workaholic. Uh, my wife and my children always remind me if I spend too much time away or if I am derailing on any part, and they remind me, are you going to church today? You know, again, you know, they. Those are little reminders that we need to kind of take into account. If your work is providing more happiness and excitement than anything else in your life, you probably are a workaholic because uh, uh, guys tend to get trapped up in that. Uh, we get our accolades and our pats on the back from being uh, praised at work. And so, and even women as well, they, they get, if you're getting praised for doing what you want to do at work, then that becomes the most important thing because it's attractive because we want to do well. Um, work, work in the long hours, though, can hurt our family relationship. And the United States has now become uh, the world leader in nonstop work. We don't call it the American uh, work ethic for nothing. I mean, we, we now average about 50 weeks a year uh, in the average workplace for work in a work year, uh, only averaging two weeks off. The average American works nearly 2,000 hours a year, and about 40% of Americans put in 50 hours or more a week. Now, this is not a problem that we need to uh, take lightly. It's estimated 60% of the absences from work are from psychological problems due to stress, job burnout, self-medication to be able to handle those stressors, and it costs our economy $57 billion a year to be able to deal with that symptom alone. Pay cuts, layoffs, endless work days, disappearing vacations, and Americans are coping with an unprecedented level of job stress. There's a psychiatrist by the name of Edward Hallowell. He comes out with a book that entitled, that is entitled Crazy Busy, and it's about the overstretched, overbooked, and, and, and people who are about to snap, but it's strategies for coping with a world that has gone ADD. But uh, Dr. Hollowell discovered a new trend, and it's called ADT, and I don't mean the security system. <laughs> ADD is attention deficit disorder is a diagnosed thing. ADT is attention deficit trait, and that's when a person becomes so busy multitasking, trying to answer an email, talk on the phone, text, drive, uh, and do something else at the same time that they lose track of priorities and become consumed with the little things. It's like, you know, the, uh, you know a dog, squirrel. You know, you, you say everything is a distraction. Facebook becomes a distraction. The internet becomes a distraction. Trying to multitask at such a level can distract us from what our priorities are supposed to be. And our priorities as we balance life, as we look at the scripture, as we try to figure out what is important and what is not important or what should be prioritized over something else, here's where we derail. If we could read the minds that come to church every Sunday, it would amaze you how many people take worship hour and do work. Now, I'm not trying to be depressing, and I've told, uh, uh, I'm not telling most of you anything you don't already know. Everybody knows the problem. The question is, what is the solution? I've got news for you. I've got good news for you. Uh, believe it or not, the solution is found at the very beginning, the very beginning of time, the very beginning of human existence, and the very beginning of the Bible. And God who worked to create the world, and a God who created the very concept of work, and a God who created the very first worker, didn't even let life get started without instructions 
on how to maintain balance in our life. And we find it right at the very beginning of Scripture. So when you look at the Bible, and we're there in Genesis chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3, which is our focal verses this morning. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Well, the first thing that we need to look at this morning is the cure for a workaholic is balance. You've got to have balance. You've got to be able to relate properly to your work and relate properly to you to learn how to maintain your physical, emotional, and spiritual equilibrium. So uh, how do we do that? We're going to look at things. I have three things for you this morning to take away uh, for you. Number one, balance your life by resting your body. Uh, balance your life by resting your body. The Creator God, even when He formed the universe, where we live, where He showed us an example of how to balance with rest. He says in, in verses 1 and 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day God completed His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from the work He had done. God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. From the very beginning of human existence, we'd see the Scripture, God built two principles into everyday life. Number one, is the principle of labor, and number two, uh, the principle of leisure. These two principles are important, and he even made them part of the Ten Commandments. If you look in your uh, notes there, the, the scriptures are going to be in there, and you don't need to flip over there. You can if you want. Exodus chapter 20, verses 9 and uh, through 11, he says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servants or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you for in six days. A sojourner, if you translate it into common times, would be somebody who would be your executive assistant. You're not allowed to make them work for you. He says, For in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. I don't want you to get the idea that God doesn't like work. There's nothing wrong with work. God expects us to work. He set the example of work, and there's nothing wrong with work. Hard work or good work ethic is excellent thing. It's an excellent thing to have. God had a job to do, and when he created the world and he stayed at it until it was finished, he made sure it was done right. And so we see this example set out. Adam had barely been created and was still a newlywed when God put him to work. Adam was still a newlywed when God put him to work. It says in uh, Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and care for it. And God gave Adam a garden to live in, but it was Adam's job to tend the garden and take care of it. Work is so important you don't even find the concept of retirement anywhere in the Bible. Did you know that? The concept of retirement is not a biblical thing. It is a man-made thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody wants to retire and, and do those things, and that's fine, and that's a great thing to do, and that's taking something like money and making it work for you so that you can do that. But God never intended for us to stop working once we retire. As a matter of fact, you can take the retirement part and put it in and do something for the Lord. Perhaps that. Perhaps you go to uh, become a missionary. Perhaps you uh, get involved in your church and you are doing something full time within your church. And God intended for that to be uh, so that it would continue on. There is a purpose there. One of the most startling statistics that I have read is that the uh, time that a person who retires from the military to when they pass away, on average, in America, is five years. Five years, on average, when a person retires. They stay so busy, and they've got so many tasks to do, and they've been that way their entire life, and when they step out of that, and they don't have anything to do or any responsibilities, all of a sudden, they have an average life expectancy of about five years. God didn't intend for us to take it out of fifth gear necessarily. He, it's okay to slow down, but he wants us to stay busy about doing something. And the priorities, when we look at them scripturally, become cool because as we balance those priorities, when we balance God within that whole scheme of things, we accomplish much for the kingdom that is around us. 
Work's important, but the idea of retirement is nowhere to be found. We need to stay busy. So as we look at the scripture, and it says in Genesis 2, 2, at the same time that God showed us how to work, he showed us how to rest. He said the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from which uh, he had done. This is the first time in recorded history that anybody ever took time to rest. Why did God rest? He doesn't get tired. It's not because uh, 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 he was bored. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28, it says, don't you know anything? Haven't you been listening? God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He is creator of all that you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired, doesn't pause to catch his breath. He knows everything inside and out. The psalmist in 121 goes on to say, God never tires or sleeps in verse four. God was not tired at the same time when he finished his work and felt like it was completed. He felt like it was important enough to take a break and set aside a day just to rest. We're told something very interesting in verse three of the scripture. We're told that he blessed the seventh day. Now, out of all the days of the week, it is only one that he blesses. He doesn't bless the other six days. He, he blesses the seventh day. He made it plain that there is to be something special about the day of rest. We know a lot about uh, this concept of rest uh, when we look at the Hebrew word. It comes from, uh, the, it gives us the English word Sabbath. And the Sabbath literally means to cease activity or to quit working. Whatever else the Sabbath day was meant to be, it was meant to be a day of rest. I remember my mom forced me as a kid to take piano lessons for two years. And here I am doing the same thing to my children 50 years later. You know. And uh, I didn't do well. I, I didn't need it. We, I was supposed to be practicing all week, and uh, he would come, and, and I knew he was coming that day, and the day he would come, I'd run into the, to the, where the piano was, and I would try to bang some notes out in, in 20 minutes before he got there, and that guy knew that I hadn't been practicing all week. I wasn't fooling anybody. The guy was a really good uh, instructor, but he was getting paid, so he was showing up every week, and I was, I was suffering through. But there was something I remember in one of those things that uh, he taught me that I, that I learned early on, and it was trying to learn to read music. There were some little marks on the page uh, that always uh, I tend to always overlook. And one was kind of squiggly, and the other one looked kind of like a hat. And I, honestly, I never paid attention to them, and if you knew my personality, you would understand why. Because uh, what those little marks were for was they were uh, uh, marks that were called rests. There were times where you were supposed to pause in the music. Every now and then a musician is playing on a certain instrument and he comes to what is called a rest. And he's supposed to do exactly what that means right when he comes to it, to stop playing. And it's not because he's tired. It's because it's part of that particular piece. And it's necessary in order for you to catch it and to understand it. That's when the work is over. On the pause. And the music of life God's dictated a principle and even built into it the way he created our bodies. And that is after every six measures of what we call days, we are to take a rest. There's nowhere in scripture talks about 24-7. Uh, that's not in God's vocabulary. All work and no play does make Jack a dull boy. It also makes him a sinful boy, according to the scripture. And so when we look at the scripture and we see what we're supposed to do in order to attain balance, in order to go forward and say, okay, I'm going to get this under control. I'm going to get my family under control. I'm going to get work under control. I'm going to get these things under control. He says you have to maintain balance and you have to have rest. It's important to understand the reason why God has built the day of rest into our life, into mine and yours, is so that we don't get less done but that we get more done. And I would, I would, I would uh, challenge you with this understanding. You're the number one fast food restaurant right now in America. Does anybody know who it is? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, who is closed on Sundays.
mandated by their CEO, Mr. Kathy, who was a devout Christian and a deacon in his church when he started the company. And he said, nobody is going to work on Sundays. You know what's interesting about them being the number one company, uh, fast food company in America? Is that they are compared to companies that are open 24-7. And he makes more money than those companies are making and mandates uh, a certain type of criteria by all of his employees that they have to be the smilest, happiest people in the world. <laughs> Make it Disneyland, people. That's his model. And so when everybody walks into a Chick-fil-A, they've got these people who are smiling, but everybody takes Sunday off. One of the other most uh, successful retailers in the country uh, that has been in the news lately is Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby, when you walk into their uh, store on the glass window, it says, we are closed on Sunday so that our employees can observe uh, the Sabbath. And that's what's on their doors. And it's interesting to me that that company grosses more money than any other retailer like it across America now in the world. It is interesting to me to see that when people honor God in those things, God says, I am not going to take something away from you. I am going to, watch this, bless it. I'm going to bless that because you are honoring me. We have a guy in our church. I preached a message about four, I don't know, four, three, four years ago. And uh, Carl Lee uh, owns out of seat. Get at us. If you get seafood, you should go over and get it from Carl. I'm not, I'm not doing a pitch. You didn't pay me for that. But uh, there was a, a, a time where he was open uh, seven days a week. And we did a sermon that touched on this verse, and he walked away convicted. And so he closed the doors on Sunday, and he's now not open on Sundays. And it was a year later that he came up to me and he said, Pastor, I would like to talk to you for a second. I said, sure, because I want to show you something. I said, okay. And so he took me aside and he showed me, he says, these are the numbers in my books from this year. And this year, after being closed and removing what would equate to 15% of my revenue from my entire company, uh, I made $1 more this year by being closed an extra day. But the peace that I have in my life and the stress that's away is huge. And I just want you to know that you are exactly right. The Bible is exactly right. I follow that to the principle, and God has blessed me with those things. Amen. And I have not lost it. Uh, uh, one thing in my business, God has blessed me in that by honoring it. What a tremendous testimony for a guy uh, stepping out in faith. I believe guys like Kathy and the guys like the owners of, of uh, Hobby Lobby and people like Carl who are honoring God, God's going to do exactly what his word says and that he's going to honor us in that way. He's not doing it to take it away from us. He's doing it to give us balance, which brings us to number two. Balance your life by refreshing your soul. Balance your life by refreshing your soul. Let me call to your mind again exactly what we read in Genesis 2-3. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all of its work which God uh, had created and made. Now God took one day out of the week, blessed it, and then even told us what the purpose of the day was. It is to rest and, uh, and have refreshment. And I'm going to remind you that the one day in all the Bible that carries with it a blessing is the Sabbath. In Exodus 20, 12. It clearly states the purpose of that work six days. Rest on the seventh. This uh, will give your ox and your donkey a chance to rest. It will also allow your, the people of your household, including your slaves and visitors, to be refreshed. Let me put it this way, including your employees to rest. You know, what's interesting about uh, Kathy's book, if you ever want to read the story about Kathy and about the story of uh, uh, the, the rise of Chick-fil-A, is that his employees, when polled, are happier than any other employee working for any other company. And I believe it's, a, it's directly attributed to Exodus right here in this verse where it gives them a time to rest and refresh, and they know that they are not going to have anything to do on that day. That they're gonna work hard for six days, but they are not gonna be off. You ever worked for a, a retail uh, company before or, or a restaurant industry before, and I remember working in the restaurant industry, and here was the big panic of all my employees who were working underneath me. Oh, who's gonna work Sunday? 
Who's got to work the weekends? And everybody's fighting and jockeying for position. If you could just work for me on this particular day, I'll work three days for you on this other day. And all this stress is built up because they're trying to cover so that they could be off on a day during the week. And there's this constant stressor. God knew that from the beginning of time. And he said it's a time that we need to be refreshed. It's a means to breathe. The Hebrew word for uh, this is to be refreshed. It means to breathe. If you ever go out and you took a run and you run for a certain distance, you have to stop ultimately because you are what? Out of breath. God says you need to do this so that you can refresh yourself. Coca-Cola had adopted a slogan some years back uh, when I was a younger boy. It's, it was called the pause that refreshes. You know, the guys at Coca-Cola, some of those guys are Christian going guys. They took this phrase biblically from the Bible and they said it is the pause that refreshes. And they knew what they were saying when they used this phrase back then. Now today, I'm not going to pick on Coca-Cola or anybody else, but people are getting away from this idea of these biblical principles that are so important. But this one works, certainly, for them. If you're a baby boomer, you might remember a time when every store in town was closed on Sunday. Does anybody remember that? Raise your hand. Some of you guys are like, what? <laughs> They, they used to be closed on Sunday. Now, I'm from Southern California, so they already jacked up that law a long time ago, and I never saw that as a kid. I came out here to the south, though, and uh, I went uh, out on a Sunday to go get some gas or something like that, and, and the gas station's closed. And I'm like, what in the world? You know, I thought I was in some kind of Stephen King nightmare story or something like that. Nothing, nothing was open. The doors are closed everywhere. I'm looking down the streets, and there's hardly any cars on the road, and I'm like, what is going on? I was in Sherman, Texas, and my sister Kathy, uh, where I was staying with, said, uh, we have blue laws, you know, here. And I'm like, blue laws? I'm like, I'm blue because I'm sad because I can't buy them. Is that what that's for? No, they were there uh, so to make sure that nobody was working on a Sunday. And it was just part of the culture. But you know what? I noticed everybody was on their porch drinking sweet tea and relaxing and talking and barbecuing. And just, you know, we took yesterday, I took yesterday, and I said, you know what? We need to do something. My wife really is the one who, who, who decided this, not me. Give her the credit. Because I'm the one the sermon's about. And uh, she said, we need to quarterly start uh, uh, doing something within our church that the directors and the staff people can start coming to where they can just stop. They can just stop and get together. And it was impromptu, and so every quarter we're going to go forward, and every director in this church is going to be invited, and every person, and we're just going to say, this is what we're going to have to do, and this is what we need to do, because we have to set the example of uh, that to each other. And so we're just going to have to stop and, uh, and be the people we're supposed to. My kids chide me all the time. <coughs> Daddy, uh, you work on Sunday. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, like W.C. Fields, get away from me, kid, you bother me. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, Sunday is not necessarily a day of rest for a pastor, um, but I have to make that up somewhere else. It is important. And it's not necessarily specifically the Sabbath. I get people, young seminarian people all the time, really kind of smart Alex really is, but I get these guys coming to me and saying, well, the Sabbath technically is Saturday, you know, and then we go into this whole discourse. And in your notes for your for your Bible studies this Sunday, I put a little excerpt in there on why the Sabbath moved from Saturday to Sunday for your Bible study knowledge. And you can look at that later on. But it will tell you why we do that and why it is done on Sunday and what happened in Acts that made it happen that way and why they started worshiping on Sundays because of Jesus' resurrection. And I'm not going to go into that sermon, but suffice it to say this. You need a day of rest. And I understand some of you are working and you don't have that option. But you have to have a day of rest. You have to have that time, and it has to be set apart. <coughs> Excuse me. So the concept goes way back to the Garden of Eden. And even though Adam had a job to do, God told Adam to take every day of the week and turn off, uh, or not every day of the week, but take one day of the week, turn off his pager, his cell phone, his computer, forget his email, his voicemail, and just rest his soul. Has it ever occurred to you that God could have created the world in six nanoseconds? He could have. He could have just went, bam, it's done. But he didn't. He modeled this purposely, not for him because he needed rest, but for you and I so that we would stop. Amen? And so it's, an, it's important to understand that God did this to illustrate that we are the ones who need to stop uh, once a week to be able to refresh. 
There's a story, uh, a Chinese legend of a man who went to a marketplace one day and he had a string of seven coins. Uh, the string of seven coins may confuse you because Chinese coins have a square hole in the middle of them. And so he had a string of seven coins and they would carry this around and the beggar was there and uh, he gave uh, the beggar six of those coins and placed the seventh in his pocket. The beggar was also happened to be a pickpocket. And so he took the seventh coin for himself as well. Let me explain something. God has given us six days to work and six days to earn money. Six days to climb the corporate ladder. Six days to get her done, if you will. And when the seventh day comes and we go to the office instead of going to church, when we go to work instead of going to worship, we're serving gold other than we're serving God. And we're stealing. We're stealing from God. We're stealing from our families. We're stealing from our children. We're stealing from our physical health. And we're stealing from our emotional well-being. And then we wonder why uh, we're burned out. And uh, we wonder why we're struggling with where we are. Now, this is a tough message, but you didn't hire me to be your friend, right? You hired me to be your pastor. Some of these things are tough, but we're not going to skip over them just because. Last thing we come to is the balance of your life by replenishing your spirit. There's a word in verse 3 that I don't want you to miss. It says, God blessed the seventh day and... And underline it, sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The word sanctified in Hebrew means to set apart. In the Old Testament, the day of rest was the Sabbath, which was the seventh day of the week. We observed that principle uh, on this Sunday. And like I said, I'm not going to go into a sermon right here. It's in your notes. Uh, whether uh, the Sabbath is on Sunday or, uh, or, or uh, uh, followed on Sunday or not, it is supposed to be a principle of rest and refreshment and replenishment uh, are all there and they need to be the same. When God sanctified that day and set apart, he did it not only for our physical well-being, but for our emotional well-being and our spiritual well-being. <coughs> the one day of the week that we are able to set apart was not just so we could go to the lake or play golf or play tennis or sit at home and watch TV. <coughs> This day was sanctified that we might remember to put God first. Not only in our lives, but at the very beginning of the week. I know you might not realize this, but the term weekend expresses something we believe that simply isn't true. Sunday is not part of the weekend. Saturday is the end of the week. Our culture in which we live sees the weekend as Saturday and Sunday. And we are stealing that day away from God when it's supposed to be sanctified and made a purpose for Him. When we tithe, we tithe our first fruits, our, our, our 10%. When we give up our time to God, we are to give Him this fresh 10%, not our, our uh, all right, I'm going to go just because I know I need to as a Christian. But we, we give Him, we give him our, our all right there. And on this particular day, it's at the beginning of the week that we uh, that he has sanctified it. And we say, this is what we give to God. And so we need to understand that this weekend term uh, may be something that our culture does and something that kind of derails us a little bit. Every week has to come to an end. There has to be the last day of the week. And the day of the old week is Saturday. The first day is Sunday. That's why part of the purpose of observing the principle of the Sabbath is so we can replenish our spirit so that we can renew and recharge and revive our relationship to God. When we take time to observe the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, we take time to rest our body, refresh our soul, but also replenish our spirit, letting God know that you trust Him to the other six days of the week. When we study the Sabbath in the Old Testament, we're going to find something very interesting. The Sabbath day in the Old Testament, watch this, was never separated from corporate worship. I just had a, a discussion with somebody this week where they said, the Bible doesn't say anywhere that I have to go to church. It doesn't say anywhere in there that, that, that I need to have to join a church to do those things. And I looked at this lady and I said, you're right. It doesn't say you have to join XYZ church. But it does say, do not forsake the fellowshiping together of other believers. And there is a reason for that, and that's because of the accountability that it brings into our lives that can strengthen us. 
When people keep doing things the old way, watch this, and keep failing, the world has a statement about that. It's called insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. When we purpose to do things the way God intended them to be, and we follow his purposes and his ways in those things, we see massive change occur in our lives. Why do you think God wants us to make sure that on the Sabbath day that we observe, that we don't just rest our body through stopping our work, but we replenish our spirit through worshiping him? Watch this. You can run down spiritually just like you can run down physically. You can run down spiritually just like you can run down physically. You ever been in the hospital or put yourself in a position that you were so tired that you couldn't go forward? You can do the same thing spiritually, but watch this. Watch this. It will break you spiritually to be able to not make good emotional decisions. I'm done with this marriage. I've had with you. Get out of the house. When you run down spiritually, we lose control emotionally. And when we make emotional decisions because we're frustrated, watch this, it's not because your spouse necessarily pushed you over the buttons, though your wife probably knows you like an 800 number. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not picking on wives because guys, you do the same thing to them. And back and forth, you push buttons to see who snaps first. Watch this. It's because when we are out of tune spiritually, watch this, our eyes come off Christ, an objective source that we're both walking to. And as we both walk to that, we get closer together and we realize how far we are from him. When we take our eyes off of Christ and we put our eyes on each other, we see all the works and blemishes 24-7. And we will struggle every time. We cannot forsake spiritually walking with Christ in a quiet time, in a discipleship study, in your small group times. This is why it's so important to be part of a growth group. Some of you, I'm hearing some of you just tried growth groups for the first time this new semester. And you're like, wow, I, I, I'm seeing these guys with their hair down. You know, with, with like, I, I've never seen this aspect of, of Christianity before. I, I, I didn't know Pastor Tom ate ribs like that. <laughs> Changes my whole thought about it. Yeah. You, you, you get to see people who they are, that they're a human being just like you and me. I don't walk on water, you don't walk on water, but there is grace. Watch this. Grace. And it's free. And it's for you, and it's for me, it's for all of us. And it's important to be walking with Christ and to maintain our charge spiritually. Let me make a parenthetical statement right here real quick. It's not so much because it bothers me and bothers others, but one of the reasons why we turn off our cell phones when we come to church or we have a little sign that says turn off your cell phone is because we need to understand that this one hour of the week, not to mention the one day of the week, when God deserves our individual attention that nothing should compete with God. Not the game on your phone. Not the text message that you think is more important than God Almighty speaking to you. But that he deserves our attention for this time. And that we can walk with him. Let me ask you the questions. Do we have enough courage to close down our laptops for one day? Do we have enough boldness to forego checking our email for 24 hours? Do we have the discipline to let a few messages wait on your cell phone for an entire day? Can we make a commitment? One last thing as I close. The reason why God sent his son Jesus Christ into this world, watch this, was to finish the work of salvation that only he could do. So that, watch this, we could rest from trying 
to work for our salvation, which is what they did throughout the entire Old Testament. Because we simply cannot earn it. There is no rest like the rest you have in your heart when you are right with God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a lot of spiritual workaholics in this world trying to work their way to heaven. And if you're one of those, you need to realize that you can rest forever when you give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ because he finished the work of salvation for you. Here's a question. If we can earn our way to heaven, why did Jesus Christ have to die on a cross? That's right. Watch this. Because he had to, and he chose to, knowing we could not accomplish this.